I think what's happening is people are realizing now with the higher level of scrutiny that they're facing from their boards, from their finance team, from their execs, that they really have to be able to show the impact of what they're working on. And it's not just for the sake of reporting and saying it, but also because they all want to have impact. It's become mm -hmm. very clear. I'm Jonathan Gandalf, and welcome to the Content Cocktail Hour, powered by The Juice. Our mission is to squeeze out the deepest secrets of B2B marketing professionals to help you push your brand to the forefront of the industry. Let's raise the glass. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Content Cocktail Hour. This is going to be a unique episode. I'm always excited to connect with other marketers. And the joy of that is a lot of times those other marketers also have other podcasts that they host. So instead of doing an episode here and an episode there, we're collaborating with Paramark today and we're just going to do a shared episode. So it's going to be a little bit of a unique flow. We're going to be interviewing each other along the way. So I'm Jonathan Gandalf, founder and CEO of The Juice, a B2B content discovery and distribution platform. And I'm excited to be joined by Pranav from Paramark today and I will let him introduce himself. Jonathan, this is going to be fun. More than an interview, I hope this is going to be a dialogue. So I'm excited for that. I'm Pranav, and as Jonathan mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Paramark. We help with marketing measurement, forecasting, experimentation. And one of the topics that's always been on top of my mind is what you all are doing with content discovery and distribution. And in one of my past lives, there was this whole brouhaha about content syndication. So I just want to get into it. You know, it's going to be great. Why don't we actually start with that? You and I met a few months ago and I was asking you about, well, is this kind of like content syndication? And you were, you know, dropping some gems on me. And I remember a little bit of it, but it'd be great to have you say it in your words. How do you define content discovery, distribution, syndication? What's the category like? It's a loaded question. We actually wrestle with the fact that, you know, my experience with content syndication has always been subpar. And most marketers I talk to, I say, would echo that sentiment. And I, I genuinely think like the sentiment is negative for content syndication because my experience, and I think a lot of other marketers' experience has been you're paying a cost per lead or cost per impression amount. You've got somebody breathing down your neck asking you to hit a goal. You're like, oh, well, I've got budget. It's algebra, right? You say, I've got this much budget. I know I can get this many leads from it. So you do it. You get the export, the CSV of emails, maybe some other information in there. You pass it to your sales team. And 15 minutes later, your sales leader comes up to you and say, hey, all these leads are shit. We're not going to call on any of them, right? And it actually, like, I think content syndication when done poorly, which happens too often, it actually deteriorates trust between the sales and marketing team instead of building trust. But it feels good because you, you can put, hey, we got X number of leads yeah. and we only spent this much. Can I ask you a question about that? So yeah. what does the supply chain look like in that old way of doing things, right? So you mentioned like you do content. So what does that even mean? Like wh where is this content getting syndicated? Is it your content? Is it the third party who's creating that content? And where are they syndicating it to? If you, if yeah. you have any like... There's a lot of different flavors of it. I'd say most traditionally, there are publishers that have websites that get millions of visitors, right? They might even help you author a piece of content, or they might just basically repost a piece of your content, or they might even present your piece of content as an ad in places that get a lot of visits. So there's, there's a few different flavors of it. I can tell you what I was most familiar with previously was newsletter syndication, you know, a newsletter that's got millions of subscribers. They'll send out your content with everyone else that's paying them. And whoever clicks on it will go into that CSV that you ultimately get. Yeah. Okay. That makes total sense. And so I'm now very curious about how you all are changing the game, right? I've seen lots of impressive names sort of collaborate with you all. One that comes top of mind, I'm going to give a shout out to Club PF. Yes. Uh, I became a member recently, and I know that they do a bunch of work with you all. So what do you all do that's you know different and I think it's very different from content syndication, but I'm curious to hear your take on that. We hope it's different. I think, you know, there are some very like mechanical pieces of it that are very different. We don't price at a cost per lead or cost per impression. We price flat. And the difference is we've aggregated everything in a single platform. So I'm going to maybe unravel this a little bit and then I'll come back and it. answer your yeah. question. But, you know, if you think about how we consume almost anything else, music, video, 
if you're looking for a home, if you're looking for a car, fashion, news, there's a platform that connects creator and consumer or buyer and seller. But in B2B content, we were all posting content on our website or syndicated websites and hoping to drive traffic to all these disparate sources, right? This was kind of the aha moment. We're like, why are we doing that in B2B content if we're not doing that in mm. anything else? So let's, let's aggregate all the content in one place and the audience will come. And then based on that individual's profile, we can curate the right content for them. So the user experience we hope is way better. We don't share contact information of the user because we have to protect that experience, right? We can't have a user engaging with a right. podcast episode on our platform and five minutes later getting a call from an SDR. That makes us mean the value we have to provide brands is a little bit different than that traditional CSV of leads, right? It is aggregate data that can help them build the content strategy. It's intent data that can help with their account-based marketing or their outbound engine or their scoring lead generation engine, but we're not giving that individual contact information. And so, you know, I think it's a little bit more humane approach to no, um, like context like syndication. And, and, and the last thing I'll say is like, yeah. now all that said, like we still lose against content syndication because so many marketers are looking for leads. We win a lot against it as well, but there are still marketers out there that are just looking for that export of leads at the end of the day. Well, you know, they'll learn if not in this job in the next job. That's okay. <laughs> There you they go. I like it. Right. How did you all figure out that chicken and egg problem, right? Because to your point, you need to have great curated content for it to mm -hmm. become a hub that Pranav, you know, downloads the juice and that's the default way in which I consume B2B content. I imagine that's what you have had to solve for. Yeah. So what does that, you know, what does that look like? Maybe even share like some stats and like how many people are on the juice? How do you get them there? Why do they stick around? What is the value that they get? Like, why not just do this on LinkedIn and have all your, you know, saved posts? Like, yeah. I'm really curious about it now. Yeah. It's every day, you know, we haven't solved the chicken or the egg yet. Every day it's a conversation and we're trying to do both. You know, I behind me, I've got the book, The Cold Start Problem by Andrew Chen. Yeah. That's something we've wrestled with a lot, lot. And, you know, he says something in the book, like, if you're really good at getting the egg, just buy the chicken, right? That's like a, an idea as well. But for us, that user side has always been, we believe, the leading indicator to revenue. We monetize through brands. The user signing up for the platform will ultimately drive more brands to the platform. So we even optimize like product development for that. We've got 70,000 plus users using the platform oh, wow. to engage with content. We've got over 500 brands on the platform. They can be there for free. We've got an integration with G2 that we use as a proxy to identify quality brands. Mm -hmm. And of that, we've got about 10% of those or 50 of those are, are paying partners of ours that receive access to the data and additional syndication through the platform. So, but every day we have to, you know, we're resource constrained like any other business right now. And every day we, we have to say, we're going to prioritize that brand initiative or that member initiative. Sure. An outsider looking in would say, man, they have a lot of difficult conversations, but it's really become part of our culture where we've had to get very good at playing devil's advocate or looking at the other side of the coin. You know, you hear that a lot in our meetings. That's great. So you got 70,000 users on the platform. Mm -hmm. And I have to imagine that's the core of why brands come to you. How do those 70,000 people consume the content on the juice? Is it mostly through email? Is it mostly through logging into a web experience? Is there a mobile app? Like, what does that look like? No mobile app yet. It is mostly, it starts via email. Well, it starts by them visiting the platform. They build a profile and then based on what they engage with and follow, it happens via email digest. <laughs> Even in that email digest, the unique wrinkle is we don't host the content on our platform. So when our users click read, watch, or listen from that email, they're actually going to the brand's website, which is why customers love us because we're not competing for traffic. We're just driving traffic. But so it's primarily happening via email right now. It's something we wrestle with and we're working on some things that will be unique to the platform to drive people back to the platform as well. But I'd be curious from you. I imagine you all are looking at a lot of different analytics from different marketing companies. Like, how would you think about a dual sided business model and focusing on both versus, you know, the North Star metric you hear about? How many yeah. North Stars can you have in a business? You know, I'm not an expert on marketplace businesses, which I think you are closer to. So the first thing that I will say is like, take this with a big, big grain of salt. If I were in your shoes, I would focus on that 70,000 number and how to deepen the engagement with the people who are coming to the platform. 
classic <laughs> virality yeah. word of mouth. How do you get go from seventy thousand to eighty thousand to a hundred thousand without net new marketing efforts? So can you figure out the flywheel on that side of the equation? And I think it all comes down to the value that they're getting. And that's where the brand side comes in, right? Because if you have great content and it's very nicely curated, now you are feeding into that 70,000. So your North Star metric becomes that you know 70,000 person number mm -hmm. and the engagement mm -hmm. that that audience is having with your platform and everything else will, I think, figure itself out, right? It, it'll feed into that North Star. That's my take. You sound like one of my board members. I almost had that identical conversation like last week in a board meeting where it's like that engagement rate of our audience is the single most important metric for us right now. And so we're doing everything to drive that engagement rate. because there's two ways to grow, right? It is you can keep the engagement rate flat and grow the user base, or you can grow the engagement yeah. rate of the existing user base. And obviously the goal is to do both. Yeah. I am a big believer. And I think I'm, we read a lot about it that like the B2B marketing playbook is changing. Something we fight against is like the, I think inbound marketing worked really well. Specifically, I think about it as gated content. That's very relevant in our space, but it, it does feel like we're at this inflection point. And I know you work with a lot of enterprise marketers. Hey, is that true? And if so, like, what are we kind of moving away from and moving towards? I can give you some sound bites, but I don't think it's as simple as that. I think what's happening is people are realizing now with the higher level of scrutiny that they're facing from their boards, from their finance team, from their execs, that they really have to be able to show the impact of what they're working on. And it's not just for the sake of reporting and saying it, but also because they all want to have impact. It's become mm -hmm. very clear. I think it's less about we're moving away from this tactic and moving to this tactic. And it's more about almost zero budget marketing or zero based budgeting in marketing. It's like, evaluate the impact of every single strategy, every single channel, every single tactic, and the discussions are very real. And tighter partnership between marketing and finance or marketing and analytics or marketing and data science. And hmm. you'll notice I didn't say sales. Mm -hmm. I said marketing and finance because the real hard conversations are actually on that side of the equation. Yeah. So that's one. I think the second piece that I'm noticing is people in B2B are finally realizing that you know businesses are basically just made up of humans and human shocking shocking right and we all have certain ways of consuming content and mm -hmm. that means a lot more video a lot mm -hmm. more short form video a lot more listening to social proof now that might come across as you know your own employee advocacy it might come across as influencer it might come across as you know podcasting whatever you you know the, what we're doing it's yeah. all about doing the same things to build that trust with your audience and it's not going to happen by you know the tactics that we all got very used to so i don't think there's anything wrong with taking inspiration from b2c and then sort of modeling it for mm. b2b there are some natural differences around the number of people in a buying committee or the fact that it takes a longer time to make a decision at the end of the day it's not as rational and logical and linear as we all believe ourselves yeah. to be we're all <laughs> making decisions off of gut and intuition. Yeah. And you know, I say this to a lot of people. I, I don't know if you've read this book, Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. Yep. Right? He says that there are two reasons why people make decisions. There's the ostensibly rational one and then the real one. And I'm like, that's it. How do yeah. you get people beyond the rational stream of thing? I think that's going to be the big thing in B2B is you got to figure out a way to truly stand out and not just fall in the trap of, these are the three reasons why we are different from all our competitors. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. I, man, I love it. That sounds exactly like some of the feedback or some of the coaching we try to provide some of our customers and prospects. When you say show the impact to somebody like the finance department, how does marketing show the impact? Is it leads? Is it pipeline? What is the actual impact? Does it depend on who you're presenting to and from what channel? How does marketing yeah. judge in evangelize their own success. Because I think the reality is right now, and I think it's starting to get better, but for the last two years, there's been a lot of marketers trying to justify their budget, their team, and unfortunately their roles. How does marketing better show their impact internally? 
It's a great question. And I think a framing that helps to have that conversation is put your investor hat first mm. and your marketer hat second. Mm. And what does that mean, right? What you're trying to do is figure out how to allocate capital in your various marketing strategies that is going to generate predictable returns on the other side of the equation. Now, the equation is different for every customer. It's not the same. If you have a self-serve $9 a month product, whether it's consumer or business, or you have an enterprise $100,000 product that takes 18 months to sell, your inputs and your outputs within the marketing part of the business are going to be different. So model your business with a real eye towards what are the inputs and what are the outputs. Mm -hmm. And you know, lots of people, okay, one of the big things that I take exception to is like, it's all about revenue. It's all about pipeline. That is absolutely such a cop-out by mm. people who have no clue what marketing is all about, right? If it's a $100,000 ACV deal, I can, and I, I sell into that market. I do a lot of marketing, Pranav the marketer, and then Pranav the salesperson does a whole bunch of sales. But if Pranav the marketer is held accountable to closed one, the marketing team can do nothing to influence mm -hmm. closed mm -hmm. one beyond a certain point. After a certain point, it's the salesmanship, it's the solution engineering, it's the onboarding, it's the in-the-room presence with the CFO and the CMO. What is marketing going to do about that? So don't take the easy answer of somebody telling you it's got to be closed one, it's got to be this, okay. then that. What is the reality of the business? Model it out and then pick the right output that you're going to optimize towards. And it's going to be different for different businesses. The last business, I was a VP leading a, a marketing and sales dev team, and we were actually interviewing a, a CMO candidate. I'll never forget, you know, I, I forget the exact question, but her answer was marketing's job is to do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. And I was yep. just like, huh, like it sounds so obvious when you say it out loud, but you're like, really, like we all have these, the stack of chips we've been given, right? And we have to place, we're constantly placing bets, right? And it's like, exactly. as soon as you have a bet that's working, it's like, move the chips there and keep making that bet, right? Until you see diminishing returns there and then start spreading them back out again. That's something we talk a lot about at The Juice. That is brilliant. And the words that you just chose, diminishing returns, there's actually a statistical way to find those diminishing returns in every channel. And that is the, the thing that we sort of do all day long with mm -hmm. our customers is look at your historical data to understand when you invested more in a certain channel, did it actually lead to more pipeline or more sales depending yeah. on your business model? And you'll notice that as you spend more, your returns aren't linear. They actually mm -hmm. start to saturate yep. and you're hitting some sort of a saturation point. Now, why is that happening? Is it because the total addressable audience on that channel is limited? Or is it that your creative messaging is tapped out and you mm. need to figure out a new way to break into the next layer of growth in that channel? So yeah. the answer isn't as obvious. What you want to be able to do is understand the incremental returns from every single channel and strategy understand where you are on that diminishing return curve, and then figure out how you're going to break out of that and get to the next level of growth. So it's all math. That's yeah. the fun it, part. It's an S curve, right? You want to exactly. kind of keep building that That's S it. curve. That's it's fascinating. I'm a data, former data analyst. I could geek out about this all day, but I am kind of curious. So, you know, I think a lot of people get into marketing from the brand and creative side and maybe aren't as mathematically minded. I and mean, we're talking with some, you know, mathematical Yep, yep, perspective yep. here. I know this is what Paramark does. And so obviously go check out Paramark and partner with Paramark. But for somebody who's just like trying to get started kind of in this line of thinking or, or through this perspective, like where do they start? Does that make sense? Here's what I typically tell people. If you are doing more than two or three channels and your total marketing line item and your PNL is less than a million dollars, you're probably making a mistake. Hmm. So let me repeat that, right? If you're doing five things and your budget is only a million dollars, you're probably make, making a hmm. mistake. So you got to find the one or two things that are obvious mm -hmm. slam dunks for your size. And if you haven't figured out the things that are obvious slam dunks, then you're like, you know, the CEO and keep the searching. founder or like keep searching. Exactly. Yeah. And lots of experimentation. I can talk about experimentation a lot. 
once you reach a certain stage and scale where you know that if I pour a million dollars, I'm getting five million on the other side in a predictable fashion, and now it's about unlocking new channels, that's where you get into like more advanced statistical techniques. And you can go check that out, right? But in the absence of that, here's what I tell people. Have a simple spreadsheet, week by week, talk about all the marketing activity. This is going to sound like blasphemy to people, but like literally the activity, which means how many people came to your site? How many people engaged with your content on The Juice? Mm -hmm. How many people engaged with content on LinkedIn? Right? Mm -hmm. Just pure numbers. And then you put the business metrics that you care about, whether that's leads, whether that's opportunities, whatever it might be. Now, when you do this week over week, you'll start to notice a pattern. You will find that some weeks your LinkedIn went viral, right? Mm -hmm. Happens to all of us. Did the lead number move? Right. If it didn't, then what value is it going viral on LinkedIn? It yeah. didn't even move the next week? Okay, well, there's lag. Sure, yeah. it didn't even move the next week. Oh, but what about the next week? Right. right? So you actually don't need really fascinating you know, statistics to do this. You can actually do it in a spreadsheet. Just track it week by week. It's super simple. No UTMs, no click IDs. It's literally just numbers of what is the marketing inputs? What are the business outcomes? Hmm. I love it. We have a business scorecard now that we, but I, when I was leading marketing and sales dev, we had a marketing scorecard and it was a lot of that. It was just like inputs and outputs. And you're right. I think sometimes we get in our own way of overcomplicating things especially marketers, myself included. I've been known to do that a few times before, but there's beauty in that simplicity. So I love that perspective. Especially at the early stages, right? Now, when you have five different ads on LinkedIn and you have LinkedIn, Meta, Google, podcast, events, and whatever, it's going to be impossible to look at that spreadsheet and make sense of it. That's when software comes in. That's when statistics come in, right? Data analysts right. come in. Right. But at the early stages, when you have two or three channels, and you should be able to eyeball the data and get pretty good results from that. That's awesome. Pranav, if people want to learn more from you or about Paramark, where's the best place to do that? LinkedIn. That is my only channel, as you can probably tell from what I said, right? I like to keep it simple. So follow me on LinkedIn. I'm in a bunch of communities where I try to help out and just offer thoughts. So if you see me in a community, say hi. But LinkedIn is it. And then hopefully one day we will be on the juice. So we'll figure that out. I'm excited to play around a little bit. It's We're a three-person company. So everything is like, you know, it takes extra work to figure out the next channel and the next channel, as you well know. What channels um, are working for you right now? I think LinkedIn is great. I constantly get feedback from you know both people in my network and also just outside that, hey, really enjoy your posts, yeah. keep it coming. Sometimes I get feedback that, hey, you're talking about too many things, narrow <laughs> your lane, right? Like pick your lane. And I'm like, I'm only talking about marketing, but marketing itself is pretty broad. So and I'm focusing on narrowing things down even further. And then community has been great. So Exit5, Club PF, marketingops.com, Reforge. These are some of the communities yep. that I'm part of. And I get a lot of value. And I think a lot of our, our peers get value. So I'm going to flip the script on you. So if there's a B2B brand out there that's listening to this and they want to figure out, you know, hey, could the 70,000 members of the Juice be an attractive audience for their content? What is the first step that they should take? Yeah, so we have the chicken and egg problem here in real life. If you're a brand interested in learning about how to use our platform and receive value from our platform, visit thejuicehq.com. If you want to just check out the platform for yourself as a user, which I would encourage you to do, that's probably the best way to learn. You can visit app.thejuicehq.com. It's free to sign up, poke around, see what you think. And uh, yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. It's funny, we get some of the same LinkedIn feedback. So absolutely would be happy to connect there as well. This has been fun. I might make a habit of this. I like this kind of dual perspective, dual podcast, an exercise in efficiency. Yeah, I like it. I think it's a great. It's like it's an actual honest discussion rather yeah. than, you know, us trying to sell each other on something or sell the audience on something. I think hopefully people learn from how to do content right to a large degree from this conversation. And I'm generally excited to go check out the juice as a user. So I'll definitely be signing up very soon. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody, today for coming along on this ride on this dual podcast. Until next time, keep exploring Paramark, keep exploring the juice, and we will all talk soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. See you all. 
Thank you for joining the Content Cocktail Hour powered by The Juice. If you want to see more episodes or more resources curated for your role, join us on app.thejuicehq.com. See you next time. Same time, same place. Cheers. Cheers.